Having that knowledge of the other person, the potential customer, means we can start matching our products and services with their needs. We're making conversations about features and benefits count. Slightly under promise and over deliver, but do both by modest margins so you aren't setting yourself up for like, well, you can do this in 10 minutes. You know, <laughs> no, this last time, let's give a 10 minutes notice this time. Sell me this pen. It's a famous scene from Wolf of Wall Street where the, you know, the lead player, Leonardo DiCaprio says, sell me this pen, bro. It's about supply and demand. Well, actually, it's a fundamental selling point and one that is often rushed past in our enthusiasm to present product features and benefits. And it doesn't really matter how great your product or service is if you haven't identified a need. Now, features, advantages and benefits, or FAB, something you may have heard, is banded around a lot in sales training. It's something that really got my own knickers in a twist back in my early days. So what's the difference between a feature and a benefit? It felt like the same thing. And then about 13 or 14 years ago, I met Jane Pallister, who introduced me to the Fab Tecker theory. So let's get on with it, shall we? It's making conversations about features and benefits count. So Fab Tecker was something I created or developed, and it gives a structure to a sales conversation. It gives great structure to a piece of marketing because our marketing is not always a spoken word. It's usually what we've written down somewhere in a social media post and what have you. It could also be a great structure for putting together details about your product and service when you are preparing a quote that follows up in a conversation. So Fab Tacker, F start, that stands for, it's an overview of what the company does or what the product or service does. So in other words, a feature is a special characteristic of a particular product or service. And that's what makes you stand out. And this is why we, you know, we do networking because we want to stand out and we want to get to know people. And we want to have an appreciation of what people do so we know how can we can match our products and services with them. So the F is features. This is an overview of what the company product or service does. And it could even zone in a special characteristic that a particular product or service has. So for instance, a suitcase made of a specially developed material, bit of science, and it's a brand new material. Then we have the advantages, and this is focusing on the aspects of the products and services which are creating clear and measurable benefits. So the advantage, we're talking about this special flight suitcase, is what this benefit delivers in terms of the positive. So the material is tough, yet amazingly light. And then the benefits, this is detail on the benefits created by these products and services and specific or special characteristics. So Talking about the suitcase again, giving you a little flowing example there, is the benefits are, well, basically, you can pack more without breaching weight limits. Secondly, the contents of the suitcase are thoroughly protected throughout a flight. And we've seen all those videos where the baggage handlers are like basically lobbing things on and off, you know, conveyor belts and into uh, the bellies of planes and then back off again. Now, that's fine. So people know about the features, advantages, and benefits of your product and service, but they need more than that. It's very important to talk about the T, so target, who the product or service is aimed at. So people know that by description, they are a natural audience for that particular product and service. And then that gets them to sit up and and, and take notice a little bit more. Also, because if we're producing this or presenting, you know, all about us and our products and services to someone new, then we need to think about evidence. And this is sort of research independent proof that what you do or what you offer really works. So, for instance, 
talk about the suitcase again. And, and this is not research you've done personally. It's not what we call primary research. This is a study I've done. But just evidence that's out there. So, for instance, talking about the suitcase once again, independent proof that what you offer really works. So it could be data, statistics, research, case studies, portfolio, like testimonials. And so, obviously, customers that dealt with you, they're happy, they're confident, they have a great outcome. But also, there could be some research in the tourist industry that says, you know, 30% of luggage that goes onto a plane comes off damaged. And when you open the case, you know, things are broken, hair dries, and goodness knows what. So evidence, it's independent third-party research. It's not come from you, it's come from other people saying that what you do really works. And then we talk about the C, the fact table, which is confidence. And these are things that you offer up to, I suppose, give that first time purchase of your products and services some confidence. So it should be, you know, showing with them what accreditations you've got, skills and experience. It could be special buy me now offers. And and special offers are usually based strategically on shifting mo- slow moving stock, boosting sort of buns on seats when things are selling slowly. But also a special offer it is is actually cutting a little bit of the price down under specific circumstances, which lowers their risk of them trying you for the first time and not being happy. So sometimes confidence building can be Look, let's do it slightly cheaper. And, and so, you know, we, 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 we can wiggle around a little bit on the price without compromising what we're doing, but it just takes a little bit of the financial risk down. And then the A is an action point every time. And Wendy, you'll absolutely support me on this. Every time you have a sales conversation, it's got to end on an action point, a call to action, an invite to take things further. So it could be emailers, callers, a range of free, no obligation consultation. That is a range of demo, presentation or site survey. So the action point has to be there because that closes off and finalizes quite nicely. That information you've shared about the features of what you offer, the advantages and special characteristics that deliver the benefit, what that benefit is who the target audience is, evidence, things that build that confidence and that credibility and actually ease that customer or that potential customer and then confidence, other things you can do to build that confidence. And then finally, an action point, emailers, callers, book a meeting, book whatever, have a demo. That is the final piece where there is an invitation to either buy or take it one step further towards that sale. So there's about Tekka in a quick explanation with our lovely little suitcase, lightweight, sort of like damage proof materials that are used that give you all those advantages. See, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? When you put it like that. Especially when you su- use a, a suitcase as a little sort of like rolling example, because it, I think it's really important when you're explaining something that you've got a little, a little sort of running example. Yeah, I understand. Because features, advantages, and benefits, people think, well, the advantages are the benefits. But a feature is a special characteristic. An advantage is what, you know, what this characteristic does and, and helps. And the benefit is what it actually delivers in terms of that positive. They're all quite heavily interlinked, aren't they? You can have yes. a feature and you can describe a feature and also be describing an advantage or a benefit at the same time. And I think that's where it can get a little bit of a, a muddle, can't it? When Absolutely. When you want to break it down. So it's like the thing to the function to the emotion almost, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And the benefit could be, you know, that, there is a psychological benefit, that, going back to the suitcase example, is that you can fly with ease knowing that the case is that light, you can pack more into it, and we love that, don't we? And secondly, it's it's a really durable material. So although it's lightweight, it really is tough and protects what you've packed in there. 
And so the psychological benefits of that is also, yes, we can pack more, there's less likelihood of damage. But we also feel better on that flight, knowing there's going to be no drama when you get the case back and open it up. It so, is that peace of mind, well, isn't it? It is. And that's how insurances work. When you say peace of mind, quite a lot of their marketing, their ads talk about peace of mind. Mm. It does a practical function, yeah. but also does an emotional, psychological function. That's the great point, I think, isn't it, around sales? And I think every conversation is is an underlying sales piece yeah. to it. In business, it has to be, you know, yes. not overtly, but discreetly, because we want people to know more about us. We want to learn more about them and their business and their business context and circumstances, because that's having that knowledge of the other person, the potential customer, means we can start matching our products and services with their needs, because everything you do, there's one of two things. It either provides a gain or solves the pain. That's what we're selling, really. And reducing any fear or doubt on yep. both sides. This is why I find it fascinating when I'm dealing with um, clients that I'm coaching. Everybody focuses on the client and often the challenges for them moving forward lie within them, not necessarily understanding clearly how to explain what it is that they do or who it is that they do it for them or having the confidence to talk about it. By yeah. doing those, all of those steps in the Fabteca kind of piece, yeah. so it's from both sides of the coin, it it can be a really, really clever trick. Yeah, it's a clever little route to take in that sort of sales conversation, that marketing conversation. Very much so. It's carefully structured and and it does the job. It sort of does everything that a sales conversation needs to do. It explains quite clearly what is on offer how it delivers those benefits, what special characteristics do that particular job, who you're targeting, and, and actually presents the evidence and the confidence plus a closing action point. So it, it's neat and tidy, and it's a structure that any product or service could be attached to in terms of either verbally that sales conversation or even on paper that sales conversation. And. A lot of activity that businesses do now starts online, doesn't it? It starts with the written piece, this content, content craze. But of course, what is written down needs to align and be the same as what you would say in a real conversation. You know, for me, it's, I think I did, I put something up online recently about content plus connection equals conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's that chicken and egg. What comes first, the content, you know, and because everybody says, oh, sales and marketing, but actually your marketing comes before the sales. Absolutely. The, the marketing really is the promise and the sales is the fulfillment and that matching process. That's where the sales really get to know the client, even if it's sort of online, that there is no information gathered on a transactional basis including permission to go back with further marketing. But even, you know, the invoice is setting up a proposition for your business to to draw people to it. They've got to have that sales conversation to consolidate and deliver what the marketing is promising. And I was saying, you know, always only ever promise what you can deliver and always deliver what you promise. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. And over-deliver if you can. Yeah, yeah. Definitely over-deliver. Slightly under promise and over deliver, but do both by modest margins. So you aren't setting yourself up for like, well, you can do this in 10 minutes, you know, <laughs> notice last time. Let's give a 10 minutes notice this time. So yeah, you have to do that definitely. Um, it's about lighting the customer, making them that happy with your products and services and the way they have been treated and, and respected during that process. So they're likely to come back to you. And ask for more, sell more. It's, it's it's all about building the foundation of the care and respect, and, and getting enough information from your customer so you can do that matching process and look after them properly. And in doing so, you're more likely to build up a, a loyal base of repeat customers. Not only that, 
you'll have fan raving fans talking about your products. Yeah. So they're in a circle of friends and family and work colleagues also get to hear about you. So that yeah. domino effect really yeah, can exactly kick in. You want them evangelizing, uh, you know, and in fact, do it right. And actually, there's no harm in telling them what you want them to do. You know, if you're really, really happy, tell other people, share it, repost it, you know, give me a testimonial, case study, blah, blah, blah. There's no harm in being directed because then they know exactly what you would like them to do to help you. And then that powers it up even more. Testimonials and, and praise about you from others is more believed than you saying, I'm brilliant at this, this, and this. Because we would, wouldn't we? We're not you saying good at this, particularly bad at that. So, and, and then, and when you are running a business, you are on your marketing foot 24 seven anyway. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an area that is not necessarily taught. It's not easy, is it? If you're, if you're not naturally from a sales and marketing background or in the industry, being a business owner and then looking to apply marketing, then sales can be a real tricky topic, which is why I loved the Fabteca model. I was about to say that helps you with that conversation structure. If all that people have is a structure on how to lead that conversation forward, but obviously Mapping in time so the customer can ask questions and ask for clarification and really, truly listening, listening to them, active listening, you know, means that you can have that conversation. You can get input and feedback from them and still carry on that structure to a very productive end and hopefully be, you know, turning them into a customer of yours. And if not, and it's like a, a not yet, not sure, not quite ready, the action point could end on the next step that will maintain that relationship, won't close the door. And then when moving near that bullseye, you can contact them again, open up the conversation, take it forward on the tab, tab techer sort of framework again, and hopefully get that sale a little later in the day. And there are so many different frameworks and structures out there. I've, got my 4R formula, which is the find yeah. the, the right person for the right reason at the right yeah. time. So then the results look after themselves. And that's just a, sim- a simplification of, of how to stay on track. And a lot of these frameworks, sometimes you just need something very simple. Sometimes you need to break it down. And this is what I find sometimes when I'm working with people, you know, 12 step programs, six, six months, 90 day success programs, whatever you want to call them. Everybody goes at a different pace because they've got a different level of understanding of a piece of that puzzle. And usually it's because we're trying to get from A to Z and we miss out M N O P Q. Yeah. Yeah. And you need a little bit more time on that than anything else. And also, we aren't natural salespeople, not all of us, as you say. You know, when you go into business, you have to be more comfortable with the sales and marketing, you know, side of things and marketing first, sales follows. But, you know, all these structures do help people have a good, fruitful conversation about their products and services. But in a way, the, their customers become quite sure about what's an offer. And that they have all the reassurances and confidence building that they're willing to buy this product or service for the first time. It's not going to let them down. When we're in business, uh, and I've been in business like 23 years. So, and before that, I was in sales anyway. So, I mean, I get up and I'm, you know, this is natural to me. But when it is these structures, the structures you offer and FabTech as a structure, they are so valuable and so important and so critical. Weren't you in media before? I was, yes, 20 years in radio. So I started off as a secretary, as a commercial trainee, learning to type, and that was the cleverest thing I ever did because I do sales consultancy and advice. And on the consultancy side, you're producing lots of reports and information. So like being able to do 100 words a minute, typing is brilliant. And then I sort of like fell into media, almost on the secretarial side, but ended up being a commercial producer. So again, you know, I was 
responsible for crafting or recording anything from a 10 second app to a 60 second app that had to sell jobs, houses, cars, furniture, garden centers, Christmas products, anything like that. And, and so you get this shape and this structure that you know is going to work and end on an action point. And I did that for 20 years. So commercial production, then into sales, then sales group head, then sponsorship manager, all in radio. And then I sort of got, I don't know, as exciting as it is, you sort of get, I need to do something else now. I need to recharge my batteries, do something. So I went self-employed 23 years ago, never looked back. And I've used a lot of my radio industry and my secretarial industry, drawn all those transferable skills into what I do today and what I've done for the last 23 years. Mm. So well, what, whenever you have a conversation with you, Jane, you know, look, I'm folding my arms, you make yeah. bloody sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Oh, well, I'm going to play this recording to my husband and son. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Listen to me. Yeah, I mean, and and ironically, because I've done this for so long. I mean, we're talking about 20 years of radio, about 43, 43 years. I'm officially a pensioner, became a pensioner in March. However, that does not change the status of my business and what I do and what I get up to. No. So, you know, I, I have no intention of, of, of ever sort of retiring. Acres I have a house to renovate with my husband. Uh, but secondly, just don't ever lose this. And and I, if I've got something that I can add a value, I want to add that value to the day I pop. We sort of have a synergy. I've been running my business now 18 years, and I've yeah. been doing what I've been doing since I was 17. Yes. So I'm fast approaching nearly 40 years at what I've been doing. Yeah. If you go back to the first job as, you know, selling on the markets at 13, you know, it's yeah. definitely 40 years soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My first job was 16. That was 50 years ago. Yeah. And, I was and do you know what? I often can look back to, you know, that Rugely networking, for example, where you gave the presentation on Fabteca. And I walked out going, huh. I needed that today, and that has been a lasting thing yeah. for me. You know, look, you wrote the forward for my book. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah I was honoured to do that. I've included it in the book with a line of what I do, which is, you know, helping people to pick up the phone or to start conversations. Yeah. I don't want to give up sharing that information yet because even though technology has changed, online platforms are more prevalent than the, the working folders, the paper folders that we would have had when we first started out. We can keep up with all of those things and fundamentally the psychology of the sales conversation and how people react to what it is that you have to offer doesn't change. No, no. And those reactions are sometimes what we live for because we know we are making a difference. You know, we know we're adding value. And that's where every business and every individual within business aims to be and aims to do, add value. And how many ologies have you got right now, Jane? Because the ologies sort of go up every time we speak because you're always studying for something or other. Yeah, well, at the moment, I'm writing a quality practitioner course because I've been doing a lot of ISO accreditation work for the last 13 years. Um, getting businesses ready for being ISO certified. And um, so I'm actually writing some of the ologies. I think probably the pinnacle of what I've, yeah, so I've got a master's in e-business, so a master of science in electronic business. And that really specializes on business strategy on the internet. So basically how you're presenting yourself in a virtual world, really, a, a virtual, virtual sales forum, a uh, sales and marketing forum. Uh, gosh, I'm a fellow of the Higher Education at Chatham, a postgraduate teaching certificate in higher and professional education. I did an environmental qualification last year, so it's sustainable business. This year, I'm going to do an ISO auditing course, like an internal audit course, because I sit over the table from the auditors when they come in and you know work with clients, the company I work with. Um, so it's nice to get a perspective of what they do and how they view it, not that I'm going to become an auditor. And I think some of your education has to be based on not just what you can sort of learn and deliver, 
we're giving you a better understanding of people you connect into and a, and a part of what you do, you know, in, in terms of business. So the auditing course will give me a very good insight in to what the auditor's looking for and what they like to see, what alarms them, what pleases them. Then it gives me a sharper tool to be using when I'm working with clients of that, you know, on, on those kind of consultancy projects. Makes sense to me to be able to walk in other people's shoes, even yeah. to the point where you've got a business owner who's not naturally suited for doing the sales and marketing side of things. Yeah, if you don't understand the fundamentals of what needs to be done, how can you recruit the right person and know that that person's got the knowledge? It's a good fit, I think. Yeah. And also not just the right knowledge, but the right behaviours, the right sort of mindset, because, you know, just keep staying with recruitment at the moment. You get the right people on board. You've got to have the skills. You've got to have the knowledge. But they have got to have the same kind of mind as you to sit within your business. They've got to sit within that culture and help magnify that, you know, yeah. so all of this, sort of, you know, goes into what makes a business like yours and mine still run after 18 years, 23 years. Yeah, yeah. It's back to what we would have, were chatting about last episode with Jenny and values and what your niche is and not necessarily, you know, an industry and a, a person that you would deal with, but the solution that you solve. And how that makes that business feel because you've, you're helping them solve that problem. So it seems like a really good segue to, to ask you then, Jane. It has there been a fab tech conversation that's really stuck in your mind that you could say, ah, oh, that really counted? Yeah. My line of work, the way I do my sales pitches, I work with two universities and I work with two ISO-based clients, one providing training, one providing the consultancy. Okay. And so the way I sell, or the way people acquire my services, is always by interview. And Tech works brilliantly for that. So I was uh, working with the university, and I had a Fab Tech kind of conversation with the professor there that got me onto not only a project with Stafford University, but also with the government, the Help to Grow Management Programme. And just one, one level under the, what we call the expert panel. So there was the government and the experts sitting, having their meetings. And I was just the one below feeding information into them. So we were talking about how we could sort of help put together the, the actual help to win program. This is national program, runs for three years. 30,000 businesses uh, will go through this program and we're sort of halfway through time-wise. So I spoke about the features, you know, what I could offer in, in terms of being on the team for building this and also the advantages of not be, me not working full-time for the university. So my consultancy would essentially be my time and that would create, you know, that would be a big advantage. Another big advantage was I am sort of an academic, although officially retired, I said sort of retire at 66, which I elected to do. But the advantage as well was the help to grow is actually a lot of universities actually doing the delivery. But the advantage of me is because I've been doing this as a part-time academic and a full-time business owner, is that I could bring things to life in the field. Businesses had actually taken this on. So that was the advantage. And the benefits are this becomes more credible. So businesses are more likely to engage with the university or a university driven program, delivered program, if they feel there's also a good level of commercial experience behind it. The target really, there was a criteria for the businesses. So that's what we had to actively target. So that actually, that also gave us the scope in what level of senior manager would we be dealing with, what kind of business, what age of business, and also how to pitch the content. And then the evidence, myologies, other projects I've been in, you know, where I was part of the team. And that's how I got engaged. Confidence. Again, lots of testimonials, feedback that I could present to that team. And the action point was 
are you going to give me a job or not? <laughs> yeah. Or what? Am I in? <laughs> yeah. Am I in? I was so in. And I did that. Uh, and, and that got me onto the team. And ironically, which is something that has to happen, the academics are looking at all the material on help to grow and just refreshing it and updating it because this is something that was launched as a result of the pandemic and during the pandemic. And, and things have changed. One thing hasn't changed is the growth action plan that I created for that program. 30,000 people it was approved at the top level by Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. So really, a politically, it was the proudest piece of work ever. Well, the second proudest piece of work ever done. Using that conversation got me through the door, working with Staff University, Aston Business School, all the business schools, the best ones up and down the country, got me onto the curriculum development panel and actually got me to create this core growth action plan which mopped up everything, every piece of content and core themes within the Help to Grow Management Program. And it is untouched. It's been crying out for for years, hasn't it? Yeah, and it, it's untouched. I say that's the second proudest thing I've ever done. The, the proudest thing I've ever done is during the pandemic, I work in a lot of funded programs. That's my business model. All the funding disappeared. It had to go somewhere else to help businesses in crisis. I just carried on with other people, colleagues on different projects. We worked tirelessly and I worked almost slavishly doing stupid hours, sharing what I knew and translating all the new stuff for me out like furlough. You know, no one understood what that was, but I had to sort of like learn it, get my head around it, translate it, you lay terms out so people can understand how it could benefit from that. And that was probably the busiest time of my professional life when I had no income coming in. Thank goodness my husband had. But that was my proudest moment, really, just doing what I could, being on tap for anyone that needed me and just helping all I could, whether or not I was getting paid. It was global first and it was the right time to do the absolute right things. And I'm proud of what I did. And I've got a lot of people who say just how much I helped during the pandemic. And that, that, that's not blowing my trumpet. For me, my personality is I'm very much a giver. I, I want people to benefit. And that was my, I, that's going to be my career high. Things I did for nothing during the pandemic to help other people, keep them sane, keep them going, keep them on a path that will get them through and out the other end and still in business. And I'm happy to say I helped a lot of businesses achieve that. Well, I know I was one of those recipients of uh, that evidence that you were collating that would change on sometimes a daily basis. So I thank you for that. And of course, waiting for the post, got to find that group on Facebook, <laughs> waiting for the post with Jane Pallister is hysterical. So if you need a pick me up, yeah, come and yeah. join us over there. <laughs> it's a total sort of like, it's absolutely unrelated to business. It's the contents of my hair, it's silly stuff that happens, thoughts are just Bladder through. So, yeah, skill to Facebook, look for waiting for the post. Join it, enjoy it. Yeah, and join in. Join in. Join in. Yes, yeah. So, now can you sell me the pen or the flight bag? I don't mind the flight bag either. Now, we should all have a really good understanding of those features, advantages, and benefits, and to take it even further. I mean, how wonderful is it that you can have a little rhyme in your head that can be applied to things in life? I hope you got great value out of what we talked about today in our Making Conversations Count episode. Next time, we're going to be talking about time and databases and that all-important following up 